Hi, Jen. Hi, Pat. Good to see you. And it's the end of your exhibition here at Fireworks, yep. which, which has no real title, but um, I can see that there's a strong feeling running through it, which is also picked up and is sure that you're currently in a very important exhibition, which is at the Queensland uh, University. And it's covering the history, I guess, of Propanar. So tell me what you think the continuities are with this exhibition and this, um, the big exhibition at UQ, bearing in mind the first things you see before you even enter the state, uh, the, 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 the UQ gallery. Well, I, I think it's uh, really, this, this exhibition is a flow on from um, the UQ one, really. Um, so I just um, kept working away at it and, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a good, um, a good thing too, but at, at times I was working on them both at the same time, so, um, yeah, it but just, one thing led to another. But what comes together for me in the room is the continuity in your own work. So we've got yeah. Irvine back massacre behind yeah. you, and that's been well. A really it's always been like that. It's been a consistent theme. It's yeah. never gone away. It's mutated. Yeah. Um, it's kind of core to what your practice is. Yeah. Well, it was about shields from the very beginning, you know, um, and I did a lot of research on. Um, a massacre from my grandmother's country and uh, um, the Irvine Bank massacre and that's when this painting came about um, which um, I had a very uh, interesting person help me with <laughs> was my studio supervisor <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. It seems like going back into the Punic Wars. And I painted that picture, I think, about five times. Yeah. Yeah. I have a smaller uh, production of this at home that I, that I keep. Um, and it's about the size of one of those panels. It's an incredibly interesting, I, can I call it a generation point for you? Mm. Because you had to do the research to find out mm. what happened to your, your forebears, to your grandmother specifically, and to the other people, which um, is difficult, I guess, and harrowing. And you weren't able to get into that until you were a mature woman. Yeah. Sure. So do you want to talk a little bit about your early life before we come back to Irvine Bank and shields and targets and the way these things are peppered through with so many layers. Hmm. Well, uh, my, my early um, years, uh, especially as a child, I, I, there was a big disconnect between my Aboriginality and, I mean, I knew I was Aboriginal, but um, I, I was brought up in, in a home, mainly. In Brisbane? Yeah, um, well, all over actually, Toowoomba, different places, Sandgate. Um, and I um, didn't get to meet my mother until I was about 32. 32? Yeah, 34, something like that. Marjorie. Hey? Marjorie. Yes, Marjorie. And um, she was actually born in North Queensland too, so. The, one of the paint, uh, paintings that, or works that I did for UQ was about that story about my grandmother's country, about my mother's country, about my great-grandmother's country, because they were all born in, in, in their country. But I wasn't. I was born in Brisbane. Um, and the story goes that she was sent down here because she <laughs> used to get herself into too much trouble. <laughs> this is your mother? Yeah. Oh, I wonder what the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I was a bit of trouble in my early years, but um, I, I seemed to settle down for a while. <laughs> um, and um, I never really settled, I think, until 
I started getting into my uh, art practice. And I always, always drew as a child. And I was having this uh, conversation with someone, you know, how did you first start drawing? And I said, oh, well, we didn't have much to play with when we were in homes. And they'd just go, go outside and get a stick and draw in the dirt. <laughs> so that's what we did. You had it from the very get-go, this urge to draw. Yeah. And you also had a spirit. So I say that, you know, when I think about you and I think about your grandkids, for example, and how your own kids, if they see the grandkids playing up, they can tap it back to your genes and that capacity to yeah. have fight. A bit of the warrior woman in you. I've often been accused of being the, the problem. <laughs> <laughs> my son-in-law says that um, my granddaughter Mia takes after me. She's got my swagger and my mouth. <laughs> Not a bad combo if you're in the art world though, yes. especially working alongside guys like you're working with in proper art. But mm. we'll get to that later. So you didn't meet your mum, Marjorie, until you were... In my 30s, yeah, In your 30s. 30s. But before that you had sort of worked in an, a range of different vocations, but yes. the love for the visual, for design, for making never left you. It was always there, wasn't it? Mm, yes, certainly was. Um, and I, I think I, I, put, I put that down to, I, I always loved fashion. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember as a young girl, I used to sew because I couldn't afford to buy, sew all my outfits. And, um, and this, this was when I was like 15. And I'd, there was always a group of girls on the train that used to look me up and down and either, you know, whisper to each other or they'd just laugh, you know. <laughs> because of the way you were dressed? Yeah. And where were you getting the fabrics from at that stage? Um, oh, like in those days it was no problem to come up with a, an outfit with um, half, a, half a yard of material. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, enough for a mini skirt and a top or yeah. even a dress wouldn't have been more than a metre and a half. And you're living in Brisbane? Yeah. And then, so what were you working at down those, like around that time, at 15? I was working in the valley. Right. Um, not in the usual occupations that get, <laughs> I must say. Uh, but I was, uh, I was a sewer. I worked for... King G for a while, and then I went to Kerry Craig. Do you remember Kerry Craig? Of course Craig? I do, like high yeah. fashion, yeah. coming out of Brisbane. Yeah, and she was just across the road, and I, I was cheeky enough to go across the road and ask if I could have a job. Now that's big cheek in yeah, those days. Yeah. And so were you cutting as well? Um, no, I didn't, I didn't cut. But I, machining? I, yeah, I didn't do any cutting, I just did machining. But I, I was... Um, yeah, this catch train to work and back. And then that led on later to something pretty significant when you ended up following that through at the Queensland College of Art. That's right. I went into um, fashion design. And I went into fashion design because I actually applied to get into um, fine arts. But there was no openings, and I thought, oh, well, I like fashion. What's, 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 what are the options? And they said, oh, well, there's fashion still open. And I said, I'll do that. I can, and, it, and it was good. Yeah. I mean, and Bonnie English was a lecturer who was, yeah, she was. really instrumental. Yeah, she was a lecturer there, and we used to sit there in, in her lectures and get jelly babies and draw around them and give put her hairdo on it. <laughs> and you said you're not a rat pack. <laughs> Don't tell me that. So it, it persisted. And by this time, you've got your kids, you've got your family started? Yes. Um, I, think, um, I think they were five and under at that stage. How many did you have? Um, three at that stage, yeah. So I want to ask you an off-the-wall question. If you were giving any recommendations to young women uh, about when do they find the time to make art when they've got family and, and, and maybe a job and perhaps a relationship to go with, with it. How do you do it? How did you do it? Well, I, w I was so passionate about it. I mean, even in, in the days when I was at um, uh, doing fashion design, 
I, I always loved the art side of it and I would make much more of it than the assignment called for, always. Yeah. You know, we'd have to go home and do detailed drawings of fashion. They used to pull pages out of fashion books and they'd go, go home and do a detailed drawing by, of this by the morning and I would then start colouring it. <laughs> <laughs> so you turn it into a visual art yeah. exercise as much as it was the yeah. task they'd set you. And yeah, and even the colour study, we had uh, um, someone called Joyce Hyam. She was really I quite remember famous. Her. Yeah, I, yeah she, she was married to Frank Hyam. I remember he taught English and Joyce taught fashion. Yeah. Both lecturers, yeah. And she, she was fantastic. I tell you, I absolutely enjoyed colour study. Um, and I used to take her, home her assignments and, you know, be, get a bit creative with it. She'd ask for a square and I'd do an oval or a, a, a curvy um, um, sides and she'd just shake her head. <laughs> it's like all I wanted was a, a monochromatic... Uh, grade scale. Grade scale down to the nth degree. And um, this... This, and I think I did fish one time, and that, that kind of did a head in. But you got through the course. Yeah, yeah. Through sheer inventiveness, and, and it was a three-year course. Um, yeah, it was, I think, yeah. yeah. Did you work? You couldn't have worked during that time. You were, you were raising your kids. I think I did. <laughs> I think I did house cleaning for a... Um, someone who's a famous QC now, um, George um, uh, Freiburg. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it was interesting times. You were but packing, I got paid well. <laughs> and you were packing it in, though, to try to get your art. I mean, you must have been burning to, to make, mm. always wanting to make stuff. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say to you. Think, what would you say to other people? Were you, you absolutely have to have a passion. Yeah. Uh, and something has to drive you. Mm. And I think um, being poor and being passionate about, um, about art was the driving passion. So I was born with it, I think. You must have been, because just the sequence of things you've talked about, you know. And then, so... I guess it was after this you met Marjorie, you met your mum for the first time. Yes, I did. And how did that, did that turn your world upside down? Not really. Took she it in your stride? She, she couldn't give me any of the answers I wanted. So I just, um, and she died a year later, so mm. uh, there wasn't much to do about it really. But it's I given just, you the link back yeah. to, to where you're from, to where you're Far North Queensland, where all your people are from. Yeah, so uh, I knew that she'd spent some time in Yarrabah and um, that she was born at Mount Surprise because um, I, I applied for all her certificates. Um, so that was an interesting look. You can find out a lot from just getting birth certificates, death certificates. Um, you know, who was in attendance? Well, you know, that's where I found out that... Um, I was related to uh, some mob up in North Queensland because uh, the woman who signed the thing was uh, named as her niece. So I knew there was a connection there. So this kind of forensic pus putting things together that you engaged in, because you weren't getting the answers that you wanted by now. No. You then used that personal experience to make courses for what later became the first Aboriginal course for Indigenous people, mm. taught by Indigenous people in this country, which was called Bovakaya and which you instigated. We'll come on to that later. Well, but I didn't instigate it. I mean, there was a lot of people at play there. I went to all these workshops that they had at the Queensland Art Gallery um, and someone said to me, come along, you might be interested. And, you know, there were people like um, um, Marshall Bell, Richard Bell, uh, Michael Ether. Um, yes, a whole range of people. And Now, what year was that? Oh, gee. 1990? Memory fails me. 
don't hold up fingers, Michael, I can't after, read it. But was that after balance? Yeah, so it's after balance 1990, yes, which was yes. a watershed. That's right. Watershed exhibition held in the Queensland Art Gallery, organised yeah. by Michael Ether and, or curated by Michael Ether and Marlene Hall, who was also at that stage yeah. working as a curator at the Queensland, Queensland College of Art Gallery. Yes, she was. So let me stop there and we'll go back just for a second. So you've come out of the course at Queensland College of Art with um, a diploma at the time, it would have been a degree or a diploma in fashion. Mm. What did you do next? Um, I took on clients uh, who came and got me to make them one-offs and I, I um, picked my clientele well. I, they were either doctors or lawyers or people I knew who could pay, who could pay yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. And I, I used to, do, I think I, back then I used to do them for a thousand dollars pop, you know, which was That's good money. That's big money. And I, I often think, Imagine if I'd stayed doing this. You'd be better off than if you yeah. hadn't transitioned into the uh, fine art world. Um, so you, you're doing well. You've got your name. Did you have a label? Yeah, I think it was Red Rose. Or, no, Rose Red in reverse, yeah. Okay. So you're making these, you know, one-off garments at huge costs, really, or expensive tastes, I suppose, for rich clients. In the background is the notion of your Aboriginality and your people and the politics of being Aboriginal in you know, predominantly white Australia. Is that ticking away? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I actually um, did a search with the um, Department of Communities, I think, and they sent me a whole lot of information back about the past, but they kind of... Um, as they always do, say, oh, you know, uh, all the files were um, damaged or destroyed in the 1973 yeah. floods. And um, contrary to that, you know, you ask them for information now and the information is available. I think they just had a policy of not... Um, Accessing. Not letting you access the information you wanted all the time. Were you angry at any of that stage about the way your people have been treated, Aboriginal people have been treated? No, I, I suppose I didn't really become uh, a political animal until I uh, went to art college and then, you know, um, on to Kaya. Let's, let's move back then. Let's go back to that point that you raised before, which is in 1990, the Queensland Art Gallery opened its doors to Aboriginal people, among others, to do workshops, and you walked through the door. Yeah. What got you there? Oh, someone said, I think Kerry Charlton was coming, going to it, and she said, why don't you come along? They're, they're talking about this new course that they're going to open it, you know, or they're thinking about. At the Queensland College yeah. of Art. And so I, I went to a lot of them. I remember going out um, to some communities and, um, um, and Michael and Marshall Bell and uh, a few others were there and Richard Bell. Lots of um, almost punch-ups <laughs> on, on, on the podium. <laughs> um, but it was interesting. Are you meaning the punch-ups on the podium at the Queensland Art Gallery? No, no. So this is when you went up to the communities. Yeah. And what was the point of friction? Oh, um, I think it might have been um, uh, Wayne Wharton, <laughs> mainly. <laughs> what was it? Wayne Wharton. Yeah, but what was the, what was oh, the problem? Look, some people are just against... Uh, everything that everybody else is for, you know? So people it's are starting to talk the among the community about whether it's going to be good to yeah. set up an educational focus. And that's focus. probably the uh, argument. And the arguments back in those days was all... It's always been about, you know, um, what gives you the right to come in and decide for us? It should be more community consultation or whatever. But, you know... Um, so on the it may or may not have eventuated, you know. So inside the, uh, the Queensland College of Art, 
Now, the, what was the link up, let's establish, between the Queensland College of Art and the Queensland Art Gallery? There was a link up in individual people. Yes. So some of us were involved in what was happening across both camps. Mm. So there was a push inside the Queensland College of Art to set this up, but also outside, you guys are mobilising and talking about what should happen. Mm. And that's where the consultation was happening as well, not yeah. only with you in the community, but also with the, mm. the white community and the black community. Yeah. Which was a pretty weird thing when you think about it now, given that in today's culture, where you've got a kind of cancel culture series of divisions and frameworks, you can't talk across those sorts of divides. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I often find um, that it, there's a lot of um, disconnect between community and, you know, um, white people. I could huge, put it like that. Huge, yeah. um, and it, it's hard to, to to cross that that barrier, I guess. Um, I, th I think you probably get used to it as as I am now. You know, I don't really think too much about whether I'm, um, you know, interacting with black or white. I just, you know, it's part of what you have to do. Nevertheless, this idea of sanctioning off a subject, a whole course called the Bachelor of Visual Arts in Australian Indigenous uh. Arts was for attracting only Indigenous people or First Nations people to be taught only by First Nations people. Tell me why that was so important. Well, I, I think it was important because um, they, I think anyway, I think referring to they as students, um, want to see people who have done important things and somehow have the mentorship there from their own people because Aboriginal people weren't always seen in, the, in in, in a great light, you know? And so it was important to have people that had done something to show them that it could be done, you know? Um, and um, they didn't want to discuss things about identity or um, their origins with white people. Um, and in the end, you know, um, because we used to get in some um, lecturers that uh, could um, do the job, uh, but it was not quite the same. And likewise, we had some blackfellas come in that, you know, were dicey too, <laughs> but certainly didn't include people like Laurie. He was a, a godsend. Laurie Nielsen. Yeah. OK, let's go back to the two subjects that were core to Bovakaya. Um, oh, but there were three. There was uh, Origins 1 and 2, and um, Identity 1 and 2, and Visions for Tomorrow 1 and 2. So that first semester, second semester. And these, what did they do, Jen? Um, they, they looked at their family history and how to research it. And um, I suppose in a way, my experience um, made me experience because uh, I remember when I went looking for my mother, I ended up going to the births, deaths and marriages and they wouldn't give me any information. And I, I wrote her name down and I said, you've got to help me, I can't find, I can't find any information on her from anyone. And uh, he went and broke the golden rule not to give people information over the counter and got her married name. Okay. And I found her within a day. So that's an experience that only another Aboriginal person could have gone through. So it had to be Aboriginal people who were teaching there. Mm. And yet 
to go back to what we were talking about before, the first course of Vavakai was in 1994. Yes. And there had to be goodwill inside the institution and there was a couple of white fellas in there who did a terrific job in getting it rubber stamped. There was a lot of goodwill. So... Um, right down to administration, right up to yeah. Ian Howard, who was mm. the director at the time. And prior to Ian Howard coming in at the, as a director, I think a guy called Colin Crisp... Yes. ...took over the role of... Uh, accrediting, getting it all accredited and moving it up to a degree status within yeah. the university. And that was all the time being pushed by an academic by the name of George Petlin, Petlin. Yeah. who had been working with the Campfire Group, mm. which included Michael, what was led really by people like Michael Ether and, and, and Laurie Nelson. So there was a general... I guess, a percolating of interest. How did you get the job as a person who was actually going to lead Bovakaya? I think um, someone said to me, um, I can't remember who it was though, said, you should apply for this. And I said, me? I'd never stand a chance of getting a job like that. But I'd, I'd been teaching for a while. Where? Um, I taught at um, the Murray Independent School uh, and I taught little ease right up to kids that were being kicked out of school um, and doing their, you know, junior and senior by correspondence. Uh, so it was a wide-ranging experience that I had at the Murray School. Um, and then I went to the Aboriginal unit at um, uh, Kangaroo Point TAFE and I worked as um, a literacy coordinator, literacy and numeracy coordinator for South East Queensland and I used to drive all over creation going to communities or to pri into prisons and having a group of Murray people that didn't know how to read or write and um, just having classes with them. A lot of the time it was just a lot of chat but you know occasionally we got, <laughs> we got, we got a lesson in. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. So you had all the skills, really. You had run your own business by then. You had a visual arts background. You'd worked with Indigenous people in community. And you'd worked across all ages, from the little ease, as you say, right through to people who were mature age. And yep. that's the kind of demographic that you attracted into the course. They came as mature age. They came straight from school. They came from all over the country, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, of course. But I, I tell you, we could never retain students that came from up north. Uh, Torres Strait or people from Cairns and above, they just got homesick like you wouldn't believe. And we lost quite a few good ones um, um, through that, home, just homesickness. Um, so, you know, you had no choice but to let them go. But um, you know, you'd refer them on to something and I always referred them on to, you know, Cairns TAFE who had a course going up there that was an Aboriginal course as well, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So all this time you've moved into academia, you've become a lecturer, you're uh, running a course the only one of its kind, degree of its kind in Australia. Hmm. You're having to write the courses before the kids walk through the door, or the students walk through the door. Yes. You've got to assess them. You've got to keep them there. You've got to keep them interested. You've also got to do all the stuff associated with that very particular form of education, which is a lot of troubleshooting. Yep. How did, did you get time for your own art? No. So at that stage, you weren't making any kind of, you weren't making any kind of um, art. You were just full blown giving your attention to the education. Oh, I had to. And during that time, you've mm. still got kids at home. Yeah. And you are raising people that have become the the bastions, if you like, of contemporary indigenous, um, non you know, metropolitan based often. Indigenous artists in Australia. Give me some of those names of the artists that went through Bovakaya under your leadership. 
Yeah, well, I, I, Vernon Arkey was one of them, and um, Tony Albert, he was like 17 year, years of age when he entered the course. And um, uh, I'm trying to think, who else? There's, uh, there's a whole oh, range. Dale Harding. Dale Harding. Ryan Presley. Robert. Robert White. Uh, Andrew, sorry. Robert, Robert Andrew. Andrew. And um, Carol McGregor. A lot of the women. Deborah Tab Taylor. We can, yeah, we can just keep going. Yeah. And during this time you're teaching, you're also starting to attract people, or the chorus is attracting people from the art side, people who would meet with the students who were involved in art themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Um, often, you know, it would be people that were doing the course would tell other people, you know, you should do this course. Um, and us ourselves, we used to go out to communities and do a drive, something which I don't think they're doing so much now. Uh, it's a different world now. Cost-cutting. Cost yes. But around that community that started to form... Yes. What, what happened? It, it, it grew into an offshoot, if you like, or one of the offshoots, yeah. many offshoots, was Propanar. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, it was really um, like-minded people that we were already mixing with, you know. Richard Bell, um, he often used to come out and say things to the students um, when, when I, I'd say, oh, they're getting out of line, they're not, they're not attending as much as they should. And, you know, I mean, people had jobs. I, I had no qualms about that because the people who worked made doubly sure and tried twice as hard to do what they were meant to do. And they, they could do that, but others would just stay away because they've got a cold or whatever reason, you know. But nothing, it, nothing would have stopped me if I had that opportunity. So you've got these artists, this group of artists, including yourself, um, thinking we've got to do more in terms of spearheading um, what contemporary Indigenous Aboriginal art can be. Yes. Tell me about the beginning of Proper Now. Well, um, Proper Now, um, apart from me saying that it came out of a, a, a group of people that were already mixing, and um, I'd, I'd um, played with the idea of um, putting together an Aboriginal artist group uh, long before Kaya um, and, may, and it was just going to be called something like Indigenous Artists Group um, and I had a long list of people so um, you know people like Gloria Beckett who yeah. sadly passed That's away right. but um, and, and others that I thought would be great for the group, you know. I didn't think it should be um, particularly um, like-minded people all the time because like-minded people tend to agree with one another all the time. I don't like to think of myself like that, but I think sometimes you get caught in a trap, I suppose, about, you know, oh, well, I should agree with this. But I'm not so much like that anymore. I've lost my filter in my old age. <laughs> so how did, how did it actually come about? Tell me about your version, because everybody in Proper Now has got their own version. Well, I remember that um, Vernon and uh, Richard and myself were the, the, the key members that were in the room, but so were, there was other people too. I mean, Lisa Wadigo was taking notes and um, uh, Josh Hurd drove me down. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I think, was I living up the North Coast that, that stage? No. Well, he drove me there anyway. Maybe I didn't have a car at the time or something. But, um, yeah, he came along and sat in but they didn't um, have anything to say. It was just um, 
Vernon, Richard and I discussing what the name would be. And um, um, that was my particular problem with the Indigenous artist group. Um, I thought it should have a name and I couldn't think of one. So we all got together and, um, you know, we kind of said um, no one gets out of here without coming up with a name. So we came up with a name and it was Vernon, of course, yeah. because he, he's uh, great at, yeah. yeah. Um, and we talked about the idea that of what Aboriginal art should be. It should have integrity. So, you know, proper came out of, yeah. you know, doing things the proper way. And, um, and then now, right now. Yeah. 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 Time is up. Yeah. Let's do it now. Yeah. And it did it now. Yeah. And it's continuing to do it. Yeah. I must say we haven't had an exhibition in a while, so UQ was, um, was great to, um, for us, I, I, I think. Very interesting to watch people in the audience responding to Vernon's film when they didn't know the connections, the young people. Yeah. A lot of them are really listening in hard as though it's you know, ancient history because we ended up taking it for granted. Yes. Now, um, your own art practice starts blossoming and you go back to things that have been with you forever, and yet you never leave behind particular uh, tendencies or loves, and that is of stitching and the buttons and the detail. Mm. And it was always, I think every, everything I ever did was about Aboriginal history. I remember, you know, they used to do the matchbox um, art pieces? And I did uh, a matchbox, I think, um, with a, a grain of rice, white rice it was, and, and a black line representing Aboriginal history and saying, you know, that th this is how long white people have been um, involved in our Australia. whole history and yet it's m had the biggest impact um, on our history. So it, 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 that particular notion has always been m my passion. So things that have run through your work have included well, a whole range of things, but let me be, you know, th throw, throw up some of them that I think I, everybody has always identified with you, and that is the shield, the target, the idea of, I guess, the pinprick or, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the tiny wounding, if you like. Yeah. Well, um, they were all about um, um, a bullet hole, so I suppose they were supposed to represent that, but they certainly came from um, my background of, of sewing and um, design, I mm. guess, you know. Um, I, I, I love to sew and I wish I'd carried it through to um, um, my art practice. But don't you think you have in, in so many ways? Like if I'm sitting here looking around me, I can see it. Yeah, me not so much. I mean, I would have been more literal. I, 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 must, I must say I once envisaged having a uh, a exhibition with uh, a room full of dummies with dresses on. Yeah, why would some woman. some sort of costume? Yeah, I think that's still to come. Yeah, like warrior woman's and the the cloaks and the. I mean, mm. it's been percolating for such a long time that one. Yeah, but just if I look at Irvine Bank and I remember the the, the sequences you went through to make it and eventually bring the cloth, the pressed cloth, back into it again. I mm. think that. There's so many aspects of that. It's like the material qualities that you've worked with for yeah. so long have come back into it. I did actually make a, a um, emu feather yeah, cloak. Yeah, that's right. If you recall. Yeah, you know, I do. Wendy, Wendy Nelson Gracie, she, um, uh, sorry, Wendy Gordon, she, um, she came down and helped me with that. She'd pin on all the things and I'd sew them. Um, 
probably would have been more messy if I'd been left <laughs> on my own. Have, have you still got it? Hmm? Have you still got it? Yeah, I do. Oh, well. And I, I did a, uh, a neck piece and a staff, uh, like a, a staff, and I have them all. Okay, I can remember them. Mm. Now, go, let's dive across to the UQ exhibition for a bit, the proper now. What's the name of the UQ exhibition? Oh, Current Affair. A Current Affair. Well, it wasn't oh, art. Oc, oc, color. Oc, oc current, current affair. affair. And was that, whose idea was that, a current affair? I don't know. I'm just um, imagining it would have been Richard. Oh. Yeah. Um, so that exhibition, as I said before, when we were talking, the, the University of Queensland Art Gallery sits in a lawn removed from the rest of the buildings. So it just is its own little entity and as you approach that lawn the first thing you see before you enter the building is a window piece featuring your shields mm. and i think um the piece was called still war still still war still war so the fight's continuing for land rights Uh, and I, d I don't know um, if it'll ever be resolved uh, because we've never had a government after, well, Gough Whitlam, he was, he was great. He was, you know, involved in giving land back to mob in Northern Territory. Um, and, um, but successive Prime Ministers just haven't been that great in terms of Aboriginal rights. And I suppose, um, I think my, my first introduction to all that was Richard Bell, because I used to come and see his shows here at Fireworks. And um, I, a lot of it I just sort of thought, that's a bit bold. <laughs> but um, I liked it at the same time. I liked the, the raw kind of nature of his work. But he's, yeah, he, he's um, certainly changed a lot in his art practice. Um, but, um, yeah, that was my first introduction to, um, you know, that kind of Aboriginal um, art that talks about political things. And I call my work political too, but people look at it and think, oh, that's not political. I mean, look at those shields. The shields were the first... Um, Defence, absolutely. Line of defence against um, first contact, um, and I always like using this quote from Christy Palmerson, who was an explorer up there, and he said, um, "Our um, their shields may serve very well for their purposes, but our guns shot through them as if they were sheets of paper." And that always stayed with me ever since I read that quote. And I can remember it always. Um, and it's true, you know, that they were, they were no defence. Um, so a lot of uh, frontier wars were won on, um, just by stealth, you know, guerrilla warfare, attacking them when they weren't prepared. Um, do you think this is a form of guerrilla warfare that you're engaged in now, where you take a shield and you put it on the front of essentially a colonialist building and through the holes you can glimpse at the heartland of what's inside? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess that work, that, that's what that work was all about on the, on the building and I'm, I'm pleased that they asked me to do it, but it was a bloody headache. Um, just trying to find 
you know, the right way to present it. I mean, I didn't want like square looking or rectangular looking shield designs that I usually do. So we kind of made them in the form of what a shield would look like. Um, you know, that kind of bin design. Um, and uh, more what North Queensland shields would look like. So um, I had a lot of help with my, um, uh, my team, which is uh, Josh Heard, <laughs> on, you know, changing things and I'd be there. We, we've um, got a pretty good rapport these days. And I, I, we can sort out an idea in, inside an hour and it's done, you know. Um, so you've been described before as a warrior woman. Yeah, that was that was that was more me because I had I had started a doctorate and I called it uh, Warrior Woman. That's what it was going to be about because I'd been doing a lot of research along the way about uh, what I considered to be warrior women and. Um, you know, there were people like Aileen Morton Robinson that came up and um, Chugganini, you know, and people think there were, there were no warrior women. Chugganini used to come up across from Tasmania and do attacks on the mainland and she was a servant to a, a, a family uh, in Tasmania who thought the world of her. She was uh, their, their housekeeper, their cook, their, you know. And then she'd go on these raids on, on the mainland and take out white people. <laughs> Do you think there's something of that kind of behaviour in the way that you've worked throughout life? I, I've always been a bit of a rebel um, from the get-go. I think I, I objected to being um, put in a home. I objected to just about everything. So. <laughs> It kind of grew with me, this idea of objecting to everything. Your own life has been filled with its fair share of disappointments, tragedies. We've talked about the successes, but in interwoven, just like material, there's been, I'd say, a generous dose of running into the brick walls or being run over by the truck or the train. Um. Yeah, I felt like a bit of a bad penny sometimes, but um, I never let it stop me. Every new challenge was just um, more excitement. <laughs> you so, know? So you're at your peak at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. When I think about in Brisbane, these two incredible shows yeah. that you're churning out, you're battling a bit of health stuff on the side, but you're going great guns. What's next? Well, I don't know, just keep going, I guess, you know. I, I, I can't um, see myself staying um, as a member of Proper now for forever. Because? Um, because um, I'd like to just continue my own art practice and see if, you know, something different comes out. Has it been a benefit to you to be a member of a group? Like oh, a I, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I just love the idea of hanging out with those guys, you know. I mean, for me, the highlight of my life is to go to a proper now meeting. Can you imagine that? Because <laughs> of the humour. Just because They're of the humour and the, the, we're so, a lot of us are just worlds apart, you know, in a way. Um, but politically, I think we're pretty much in agreement. And you're wearing a Gordon Hooky T-shirt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Gordon came into it a little bit later. Yeah, he did. But uh, he was one of the original. I like when the the original. I suppose was Richard um, Vernon, myself, and um, trying to think who the other female member was. Richard Vernon yourself, there was Laurie. There was Laurie, yeah, and Laurie for sure. Yeah, for And And um, we'd, we'd just done up this list of people that we short, thought should be in the group and we told them they were in the group. <laughs> Basically, Gordon was one of those. 
he, he, he heard that he was in property. He said, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, well, well, we've decided that you should be in our group. <laughs> And as it's gone on, all of you have changed a great... Well, a lot of you have changed in terms of what your lives are away from the proper now spotlight. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we had a hiatus there for a little while. Um, but, you know, they, other members were very busy, you know, and it could be that me stepping off would be just to have a hiatus for a while, you know, and see how I do health-wise and because my health really concerns me. Um, uh, so, um, and I really need to take it a little bit more seriously than I do. Um, if you want to get more work done, you're going to have to I, address, I, I ad address that like it's no joke. Yeah. So, Jen, just going back to what you were saying before about proper now, I mean, this is not an historical conversation. There were all kinds of bits and pieces that are going to be missed up. But of course, Tony came in, Tony Albert, mm -hmm. very soon after that. And then a young woman called Andrea Fisher, who had come right. through Kaya. And yeah. she, she was pretty remarkable. I know she was. Jewelry and... I had an exhibition with her in Canberra, I think. Yeah. And so she was a proper now, a member for a bit. So yeah. people have come in and stepped out and others, other new ones like Megan Cope. Yeah. I mean, she's not new now, but... Yeah. It's um, waxed and waned, but the core members of the group are still there. I mean, hmm. sadly, Laurie died last year, and he was there from the beginning, Laurie Nielsen. Hmm. And, and working alongside you in, in Kaya. Yeah, he was... I tell you, I don't know if I could have done the job without <laughs> Laurie. He was, he was just always there, you know? Stable always saw the good and the funny side of things and you had to see a lot of the funny side of things. Yeah, I know. There were a lot of funny things. Um, so from your vantage point today, you pull back a little, you're seeing things in a, you know, a little bit more critical distance maybe. What do you think's needed for, um, in, oh, you might not even have a point of view about it, in terms of in, the way Indigenous contemporary art is going now, in terms of how it's been produced or the way it's being received? Yeah. Things moved ahead for the better? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't returned to um, um, QCA since I left. Actually, um, I don't know. I, I've always had this thing about not looking back. Absolutely. Um, because it's the only way you can really get through it and tough it out, you know. But um, I would have liked to. I had um, many occasions where students have rung me up and said, "Oh, you know, I'm having my doctoral thing. Can you come and have a look?" And I'm like. Uh, well, my health was really the main concern that often kept me away, so... Um, but, yeah, I, I, I would have liked to be at many of those things, but it just wasn't possible. And I was also um, still a part of that memorial thing, you know, the Aboriginal memorial oh. that died, um, thankfully. I mean, not because it was an Aboriginal memorial, but just because it was an absolute mess. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was busy with other things as well. But uh, that's, I don't know whether it's still ongoing, but I, I, left, I left the committee because um, um, they based all their decisions on um, consensus, or so, so they said. But at the end of the day, I was always the dissent, dissenting member. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with this. I'm the dissenting member and I'm, I'm deciding to step off at this point. Looking back on life to this point, and you think about when you see yourself playing the role as an artist and when you see yourself as doing other things, 
Um, it's so, forgive me, but it seems to me that whether you were doing your fashion or even before the training for that, and then you took your passion into um, doing work for the community, the Aboriginal community in the field and a whole range of things. And then you set up Kaya and then you were you know, instigated with a couple of other people for Propanar. And then there's this stuff where you see, okay, now I'm in the central role. But isn't being an artist all of those things? Don't you have to oh, have yeah. multiple skills? Yeah, I, I, well, I think so. I mean, I've, I've done not just only works that sit up on the wall. I've done, you know, sculptures and different kinds of things. At but you've also produced times. a coherent community mm. of spooks, active, visually yeah. engaged spokespeople. Yeah. And that's a creation like these are. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but um, certainly um, we need some regeneration there um, um, because as people leave for whatever reason, um, you need a, a core group of at least half a dozen people, I think, you know, which we are now, but... You've got to bring the young ones up. Yeah, you've got to bring the young ones up. And um, that's, that's why it was interesting having um, Tony Albert and... Um, Megan. Me, uh, not Megan, but Andrea Fisher, oh, who right. was one of the original core people when we started out. Um, and Megan came, Megan Cope came a lot later. Yeah. Mm. So nowadays... But if you Megan was a student as well. That's right. For a while. But if you think about what opportunities there were for Aboriginal contemporary artists back then, and you think about the opportunities now where you get paid to make work in very prestigious shows, there seems to be a lot more opportunities. Would you agree? Yes. Absolutely. And would you agree it's easier for people to make a career and a big name for themselves now than it was then? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Not based on my experience anyway. Um, I mean, it was great having a UQ show and I appreciated that, but I, I had two shows coming together, you know, so it was a bit hard, um, but, you know, it turned out so. Can so, be done. So if we think about the gains that were made from, say, the beginning of when you started advocating in your lifetime for change, and we think about what's been gained and what's still to be gained, there's still some overwhelming uh, barriers to uh, Aboriginal people in this country having a voice that, that is recognised and claims that are recognised and that still remain to be enshrined in policy, yeah? Mm. Yeah, well, when I think of the Aboriginal people in community and it's like even people like Emily Naware and, um, you know, all those old women, the Pichare sisters, um, they, they still, their work was still about their country. It was still about land. It was. It was still political, you know? People don't see that. They see a pretty picture and they think, oh, that's nice. Um, um, I'm not often a fan of, of things that look nice. Um, but aesthetics are really important to me. Um, and um, the simpler it is, the better I like it. <laughs> so it's sort of, yeah, but I, I have no problem with um, other communities and different kinds of work. Uh, I, I have a problem sometimes with the sort of hybrid work that comes out of communities because that tells me they don't know enough about their history, basically. Um, and or they haven't developed to a point where they can talk about the, uh, the hard issues or they don't want to. But they that's don't. okay. Yeah. 
So if I think about the immediate future for you and what you've said during this particular talk, it seems to me that there's a show that's waiting to be done and it's going back to that warrior woman theme and to using some of the skills that you still want to work with. That's as I still have those skills. I don't think I've actually looked at a sewing machine, um, even though I have one, I have everything I need. I don't think I've looked at a sewing machine in maybe 10 years. But you've mentioned two women, three women, the Pichare sisters and Emily Nawari, who made, and we've got another, we could man, name another dozen at least, mm. who worked till they dropped. Mm. They just did not stop talking about country, calling country up, talking about the, the need for art practice, all forms of art practice, to bind us to who we are and to each other. Is that mm. part of your own push? Part of my Is that life. part of your own push as an artist? Your drive, that drive you've described? Oh, yeah. Um, um, well, you need something to occupy your time, don't you? I mean, I'd, I used to read a lot once. I'd, I'd read... I was so passionate about reading, but it turned out to be a good thing because I remember what I read. Um, and now it's just a pain to read because I have to wear glasses and sometimes my eyes aren't that great. So I tend to avoid it. So I'm going to move on to a Kindle, I think, or something like that. Um, um, but I've, yeah, I, I had a very wide range of um, uh, literature uh, presented to me at a very young age. I think the first book I ever read was something called The Ginger Man by J.P. Salinger. Salinger? And I was J 12 <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah. And then I moved on to people like Anais Nim, Henry Miller, David Lawrence, you know. And I, I, my thing at the time was to give all of my friends who I thought were um, very um, not well read, I used to give them a, uh, a few of the classics, you know. Um, and um, they'd go, what did you give me these for? And I said, don't worry about it, just read them. They're interesting. <laughs> you gave me a book just recently too, which I haven't been able to pull my Sun Tzu, <laughs> Art of War. Yeah, so. I, ga I gave all the proper now members one too. <laughs> And I said, this is our secret Santa, but I'm being Santa, <laughs> OK? So literature's all, 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 Western literature's also right through from the very beginning. Yeah. Western, yeah, Eastern. I didn't care. I, I'd read anything. From, I, I think from the age... And I was basically illiterate until I... Um, until I was about 10. And then I, did, I got a teacher that I liked. And um, she was amazing and got me interested in, you know, wanting, wanting to read and wanting to know about history and wanting, you know. Uh, and so I, I, I never, never stopped after that. And by 12, I was reading all those hideous Silent. novels. <laughs> And they asked Nin at 12, no yeah. wonder you were a rat bag. <laughs> I mean, and yet you hear the government today saying that a humanities education should be costing kids in universities double and that humanities leads to nowhere. Really? Mm. Not a good moment in Australian history. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I had a, an interesting um, time in my, my youth. And uh, I remember going to a particular reform school and they'd, they'd, they'd chuck you a novel, you know, could be anything, mostly depended on the home you were in. If it was Catholic, you'd get some uh, story about a saint and, um, or stuff like that. So I used to read, read <laughs> stories about saints 
And Saint Cecilia was my favourite saint. She was a concubine. So all this is still keep ticking away in the background of what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they had a great influence on me, I suppose, some of those homes and, and the religions, you know. Some of them were Salvation Army or they'd be um, a Christian, um, Catholic, Catholic convents. Do you think it's made you more tolerant? Uh, no, I don't. I, I've never been a great church goer. Um, I think I've been to uh, weddings and funerals and baptisms, basically. Uh, that's the only time you get me in a church, I reckon. If you wanted to say one thing to the future generation of young Aboriginal artists coming up now, what advice would you give them? Be passionate. Be real, be honest, which is basically the same. I think um, I, I was once famous for saying, um, you know, the currency of the future will be integrity. It won't be money. It'll be all about people being real.